Good evening. In knowing the truth of the pairs of opposites, you are in possession of the greatest secret of the earth. Because as soon as you know that it isn't what it appears to be, but actually is the whole of God without opposites, consisting of no bad whatsoever, nor no good whatsoever, as far as the intellect can describe bad and good, then you are free in experience, free in earth. The earth is yours. As you discover in Genesis 1, the earth is yours. You have dominion over and among all of earth. Not your personal dominion. Because as the pairs of opposites are dissolved, then so is the personal sense. So you now are the very presence of the Lord, the truth. And that truth is the dominion of that presence you are. Over and among all of the earth. And so all of the earth now reacts and responds as the truth it is in your presence. What greater secret could we possibly have or what greater secret could there possibly be about the earth experience? There isn't a greater secret than this one great truth. And as the pairs of opposites have left you, as Satan has left you, and usually Satan leaves you for a time and then attempts to visit again, for sure. But these instances become less and less and weaker and weaker. The more we know and the more we now live in and as the freedom of truth, meaning we're no longer using our thought and our belief and our effort to manipulate our experience, but we are entirely leaving experience to that which it truly is, to present itself as its truth to us everywhere we are and everywhere we go and everything we do, it's ever more or less likely that we can be tempted back into belief, of course. Because the truth of experience is so blissful, is so effortless, we live in a constant state of peace, a constant state of undisturbable being, a constant state of effortlessness, Simply beholding truth and then serving truth, morning, noon and night. Serving truth becomes our only purpose, our only activity. Yeah, we go to the cinema occasionally. But even then, we usually find something in that movie that we can share as a truth metaphor, as you know very well. So truth never leaves us and Our whole purpose, our whole presence is always that of outflowing as truth. Most of it silently, most of it undetectable by the world. Because the presence of truth is just happening as us. That's actually the greatest service. And dozens or hundreds or thousands who are in our presence that day are blessed, are lifted, are comforted, and they never know why or how or where from. And they never will.
But why, when we're living in a constant state of peace, would we be easily tempted out of it into a constant state of effort and strain and concern? So certainly, as we live more and more in truth, then belief, Satan, becomes weaker and weaker and ever more easy to deal with when he or she or it comes along to visit. Now remember, truth is not, and when we say truth is not, I mean by that the whole experience of truth. Not just the word of truth, but, or the truth of truth, but the experience of truth, meaning truthful being, mind, and form, and experience, all one. Truth is not something which is evidenceable by our effort. It's the exact reverse. Truth is only evidenceable by our non-effort, by our nothingness. It's when we're not here that truth is visibly here. When we are here, truth is nowhere to be found. When we're holding matter in mind then that which is truthful, that which we're trying to witness in the pairs of opposites, flees us just like a butterfly. It is said in the old Indian scriptures that truth is like a butterfly. If you seek it, if you try to grab it and own it, it flies away from you and you can never catch it. But also like a butterfly, if you keep very, very still and quiet, in one of these five minutes you'll find a butterfly landing right in your midst. And this is true. It is only when we are still and invisible to matter, as we heard so beautifully throughout the classes, but yesterday as well. Be secret, be invisible to the world, to matter. And then be still, without effort, without thought, without desire, without even considering the pairs of opposites, but still in truth. Then you will find that that butterfly lands on you and usually all of its family along with it. Again, there's a great image for us to keep in mind. We have to be that still that even a butterfly would land on us. And so in this way, truth is only real as us and in what we may describe as for us, as what's happening as our mind, all our awareness, and what is happening as our experience. As truth itself has the stage as truth itself occupies being, as truth itself is felt happening, the presence of truth is felt and known unmistakably, the happening of peace or freedom or spaciousness or infinity or indeed omnipresence, when the whole universe of you is so still and peaceful, that only truth is happening as you, as your universe. And 
And so for a few moments, let's be still. Still enough for that butterfly of truth to land right in your lap. still, free of the pairs of opposites, bathing in truth, happening as truth. Watch the miracle that happens in experience as you remain free of the pairs of opposites and your whole way of being is stillness. Free of the pairs of opposites. We can't be still in the pairs of opposites. It's impossible. And this is why even though we've heard, again, one of these statements of truth probably a thousand times, be still and know that I am God. We've all heard that over and over. We've tried to witness that stillness that knows it is God. But if we have still been in the pairs of opposites, if we've secretly, or maybe not so secretly, or if we've thought that God is for fixing the pairs of opposites, which I suppose we've all done originally, then being still and knowing that I am God really doesn't do anything.
because God is completely inoperable. That's a, a bad word, but inexperience, peace and God and truth is completely inoperable to experience only in the pairs of opposites. Completely invisible to reality in the pairs of opposites. It's standing right there. It's the only form there is. But to our experience, if we're in the pairs of opposites, it's completely and utterly vacant. And this is why all these wonderful truth statements have been actually frustrating more than anything else over the years because it's utterly impossible to evidence what they're telling us if we still live in the pairs of opposites. But the moment you know the great secret, as you do now, hopefully clearer and more fully than you ever have before, then you're free of those pairs of opposites. And now go back and reread these wondrous truth statements and they'll come alive in your whole universe. Now you can see what they really mean. We never were able to see what they really mean as our awareness was living in the pairs of opposites. Living in that text that Satan keeps sending. Where our attention is always drawn towards that which seems to be. Be still and know that I am God. It's from Psalm 46. Let's maybe read Psalm 46. It's a beautiful message. And indeed it will come alive today. God is our refuge. And Strength, a very present help in trouble. When I first read that, I thought I was saved. Ah, God is a very present, a very real and practical presence in amongst all this trouble I'm experiencing. But I didn't witness any of that great presence and that great help because I thought God was for the fixing of that trouble and for the bringing of the opposite to me. And because I thought that, I had to spend another 20 years waiting for the truth. God is our refuge and strength. First of all, what is that? Where is that? Withdraw from that which seems to be and come home to oneness. Step out of the pairs of opposites, leave them alone and come to oneness, for oneness. Come to God for God, as God. Remember John Ryland in the beautiful poem, when God is God to me. There's the whole truth in those few words. When God is God to me. Not when I'm trying to get God to be matter for me. So come to God. Into oneness. Is that enough? No. Wait and wait and wait. Wait patiently on the Lord, we're told. Wait. Contemplate if you have to. And mostly you do have to. Contemplate truth and wait until you start feeling the presence of God. And the very second you do, indeed God is your refuge and your strength. Now you have in experience the most practical, real, totally evident experience you have God. Right here as your being, you are now the very presence of God because you're feeling God happening. There's the whole 
key. So God is our refuge and strength. And indeed, now, as you're feeling God, a very present help in trouble. Now, we know what that trouble is, do we not? It is the trouble of both the bad that seems to be inexperienced, the whole gamut of it, the whole world of bad experience for all people or all animals or all condition. And it is the belief that we can replace that bad with its opposite, which is its specific good, its solution. There is the trouble. So all of that boils down to the belief in the pairs of opposites, the world as we can name it and experience it, being something in and of its own self. So let's now never forget. I don't think we will ever forget that, but let's make sure we don't. So God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in that trouble, that belief, which is the root of all of the world's problems, including the problem of believing it's good. So now you see already in the first two lines we have a key to what kind of help God is. God is of no help in the pairs of opposites. So God is a very present help in what? In dissolving false belief from our sense, from our being. Just like Light is a very present help in dissolving darkness. But it doesn't and cannot dissolve all the activities or all the consequences of darkness. Darkness is the root, if we can stretch our imagination a little bit. Darkness is the root of all the good and the bad happening in darkness. Take darkness away and none of the good or the bad can happen in darkness because it no longer is present. It's a bit of a poetic stretch, but we have the license to do that. We're secret agents, remember. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, even though the pairs of opposites be removed, Everything we have known about the earth, well, everything we have known about us and our ability, our skill, our knowledge, even that which we thought was our truth, and everything we relied on in getting on in the earth is now being removed, dissolved. We've discovered that it of its own self is nothing. Now what? We're floating around in space. We have nothing that we thought we had. We will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. And here we have the instruction to continue to sit still in God and as God knowing that actually, despite appearance and despite how painful or difficult, troublesome, threatening experience seems to be, how urgent it requires our effort, we are to stay still. We are to take refuge in the Lord, in oneness. Because there we are safe. Again, I think we heard that yesterday. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Your consciousness, my consciousness. The city, the house of God, the truth of being. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. 
God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Right at the beginning, right now, we have our help. The nations raged. Isn't this just what happens in most of experience when we sit and say, all right, you may be troublesome. You may be demanding my attention, my effort. But I'm not stepping your way. I refuse to react to appearance because I know that all appearance is in amongst the pairs of opposites and therefore isn't of truth at all. I know that despite appearance, all form, all experience is perfect, whole, complete, is God. And I am not going to be tempted to believe anything different. What happens? Usually experience fights. Usually it becomes worse for a moment or for a while. It rages more ferociously. It threatens, it demands our attention, demands our effort more insistently. Now, if we want to break its back forever, we have to find the courage to sit still right in the face of it. Just as Jesus did. Get thee hence. Do your best. Make your best efforts, because I am immovable in truth. There's exactly how we break the back of any temptation to believe in something other than God. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Right there, first of all, as we refuse to step into that tempting experience and do something about it, rescue it, pacify it, make some effort to prosper it or to bring some kind of comfort to our body, assistance, healing to our body, if not even temporarily. As we resist that temptation and stay still, it is because we are resisting and staying still that he, in the biblical term here, he is able now to utter his voice, which means that we are finally able to feel the peace, even in the middle of the storm. We're finally able to begin to feel the peace of the experience that we're really facing, the truth of experience. We feel it now. And as we've said, the second we start feeling it, we have the whole visibility of it. Now, it may not instantly or even very quickly be evident to your senses, but don't be fooled by that either. Stay in truth. The very second you feel the peace, you have the whole of God as the whole of you. Know that. Trust it. Now listen to what happens. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. What does that mean? What is the earth? Pairs of opposites. Now again, when I first read that, he utters his voice, the earth melts. I was very unsure if I wanted him to utter his voice. I want my earth. I love my earth. I just don't love all the bad that's happening in it. I don't love being imprisoned by illness or disease or a lack of dollars, a lack of freedom to express how I want to express, to be the being I know I am inside. I can feel it, but I'm hindered left, right and center by a lack of resource, a lack of freedom, a lack of strength, a lack of wisdom. That's what I don't like about my earth, but the rest I love. I love my family. I love my friends. I love my love. I love the country, the village, the city, 
the mountains, the ocean. I don't want to lose my earth. You see, I was in the pairs of opposites and didn't understand at all. But the earth is the earth of belief. The psalmist is talking about belief. Believing the earth to be something of its own self and still trying to fix it. So when he utters his voice as we know the truth, again, let's hark back to the fact that we must know the truth. Know the truth and that very truth will set you free. Again, does that have more life for you than it ever has before? Know the truth. You can't be free until you know the truth. And what is the ultimate truth? This is the ultimate truth. Until we snap out of our dream state and begin to hear, truly hear and live the ultimate truth, which is the freedom of being, the truth of being and mind and earth, which has nothing at all to do with the pairs of opposites, but is and has everything to do with God. Until we know that, we really don't understand what know the truth and that, that truth will set you free means, nor do we know how to understand it and start living it. Again, all we have to do is go back into our years and years of truth study and see that that's true. We've heard it a thousand times, but have we been able to witness our freedom? No. Have we been able to actually witness the miracle of truth as form? No. Why? Because of this one reason, belief. So now he utters his voice. We feel the truth of being happening. And now, remember, search me. God seeks us. But that us that's being sought is the senses we are living. The whole sense of us is filled with the light of truth. And the light of truth dissolves any remaining belief that we have about ourselves or our experience. But you see, even though we've heard that in all of the miracle self, go back to the first class, you're going to hear exactly that. Let the light of truth dissolve all falsity that exists in your experience. We haven't been able to witness it. And equally, if we go back to all of, I'm sure, all of Joel's classes, we're going to hear the same thing in different words, but we're going to hear it. It was there, but we've been unable to witness it. Why? Because until we know what's happening as God fills our senses, what's happening is the dissolving of any remaining false belief, that being the root, belief being the root of all trouble, including the trouble in the belief of good, as soon as we know that, then God is able to now dissolve any false belief. Even feeling the peace before we know that truth isn't able to dissolve it because we're hanging on to it. God can't be present for us as being or experience while we hang on to belief, it's impossible. Again, we've always heard we must release God. If we don't release God, God cannot be evident to us. You catch that? Again, this is the same as Joel's put both feet in the boat. You simply cannot have the experience of rowing over the lake if you have one foot in the boat and one foot firmly planted on the land. It's impossible. And so even as we are holding on to belief, which means we're still believing that God is here to fix our world, fix the pairs of opposites, bring us a whole and healthy, vital, healed physical body in place of an ill, diseased or injured one, if we're still believing that, it's utterly impossible that God can become evident to us as our body, as the truthful body. Or if we're still hanging on to the belief that as we experience God, then God will replace our lack of dollars for plentiful dollars or open up doors of opportunity where there seems to be none, then we're still hanging on to the pairs of opposites and it's utterly impossible 
that God can be evident as the truth of supply, which is the truth of omnipresence. It's utterly impossible. But now that we know it, and we can sit as we did, was it yesterday? Asking God to search us for any remaining belief. We now know that belief has been the root of all our trouble and all our false effort that's resulted in nothing. Or very, very little. Even if we did manage to manipulate the pairs of opposites a little, what did we do? All we did was prove that we can indeed manipulate belief a little bit, but it soon turns out to be unreliable and not true. Certainly we can manipulate belief, but it's still nothing. There's no truth there. But now that we know this, we're free. We're free of the whole world, as it appears to be. The whole thing. We know the secret of experience. We know the secret of the earth. We know the secret of form. We know the secret of activity, of amount, of business, of purpose. And now we can sit free of the pairs of opposites. And because of that, God now fills our senses, seeking any hole in it, any little darkness, any remaining belief, and is now able to dissolve it because that's now what we're seeking. We're not seeking any longer the replacement of the bad pairs of opposites for the good, but we're seeking the dissolving of all false belief. There it is. And so the earth melts. The whole earth of false belief melts to reveal the truthful earth. In earth as it is in heaven. Now, all we have to do is behold. Behold the miracle of truth now, present as you, as me, amongst the pairs of opposites. Everyone else is living the pairs of opposites. But you and I are living as the very presence of truth. Now, watch the miracle, and the psalm continues. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Is there any effort there? Is there any thought there? Is there anything but sitting and beholding the truth as experience? Behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Everything of warring form, whether it be in the mind, in the body, in the experience of body, or out there in the earth, as argument, as disagreement as struggle, the warring that goes on between neighbours, offices, businesses, corporations, and between countries and nations, stops. Truth reveals the truth of God as the earth. And so in experience, all war stops, all discord melts, all disease melts, all lack and limitation and poverty reveals itself to be plentiful and harmonious and just. 
omnipresent. But our role in this experience is simply to behold truthful form correcting itself or revealing its truth Truthful nations, truthful body, truthful beings, truthful neighbors, truthful dollars, truthful opportunity, truthful expression, wisdom, intelligence coming forth as the presence of truth is felt happening. And so we sit as the presence of truth and we behold And then we hear that beautiful statement of truth. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. I will be very present and practical in the earth, in all form in all of experience. you most certainly can be a constant state of peace. No matter what appearance seems to be doing, you can be a constant state of peace. When you realize that that appearance literally is the product of belief alone, which is nothing. With no power, no presence, no form, no law to support it, principle to support it, But this is only evident to experience as we know this truth and then rest here at home and behold its untruth. Behold it crumbling and dissolving, disappearing from experience to be replaced now. Maybe that's the wrong word. To be evident now as the revealed good of all of experience.
It is a very good thing to sit with scripture for some time each day. Because right there, and I'm speaking of all the world's great scripture, pick and choose as you'd like to. Because right there, you are able to travel around the earth with the great prophets and share in their witnessing of such miracles, such real evidence of God, such real experience of God being the one power, the one truth, despite the most viciously tempting appearance to the contrary. There are thousands of accounts throughout Scripture of the most wondrous experiences of truth. The most wondrous, the most miraculous experiences of truth in the face of all kinds of danger and threat and even death of the people. And so reading Scripture brings truth alive. And of course, the more we are now free of the pairs of opposites, truth is very real to us. And so we want to absorb ourselves in it. Every account of truth witnessed is another strength for us to be able to stay in truth when we face our problems or when our loved ones or students come to us with their problems. And they do. The more you know the truth, the more they come with their problems. Because something in them propels them your way. And that something in them is their own truth that's attracted to the light of your truth. As I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me. The more truth I have, the more men and women and animals and conditions are drawn to me. For one reason, just so that their truth can be known and evidenced. Anyone or anything not evidently in truth is in pain, is in prison. And so where there is light... All of experience heads the light's way in order to be freed. And again, we've had some silly examples, maybe especially throughout the last few classes. But you see, these silly examples serve a really important purpose, and that is for you to remember them. And sometimes a bit of silly humor is that which we remember. And so that's why they come. You see, no matter how appearance is dressed up, no matter what name we collectively, which means belief collectively, is given to that him or her or it, it has nothing to do with its suit nor its name. It is God. And God has nothing to do with the pairs of opposites, but only to do with God alone, the whole of God alone. And God has no good in it whatsoever. Can you hear that? God has no good in it whatsoever. The reason we say this, and actually we'll hear more about this probably tomorrow in the secret book of John. Let's lift really, really high now. We're ready. But you see, God has no good in it. God is far beyond what we can understand as good. God is far greater than what we know as good. And so, as soon as we understand that God has no good in it whatsoever, then we'll give up the nonsense of seeking that which we deem to be good from God. And of course, God has no bad in it whatsoever. And so there is the desolation of the pairs of opposites. 
God is far greater than anything, infinitely greater than anything we can ever capture as understanding. This is why in Solomon we hear that we must seek understanding for herself alone. And we've heard it in the Miracle Self classes in this way, that we must seek understanding for nothing that we can ever understand. Seek the non-understanding. Seek understanding for non-understanding. Don't try to garner from understanding herself something which we can understand. Because if we're doing such a thing or hoping for such a thing, then all we're doing is hoping to understand more about the pairs of opposites. And we guise that in truth. Oh, I want to understand the truth about this or that, or him or her, or this condition or that condition. If we are seeking God for anything at all that we wish to understand, we're still in the pairs of opposites. And then, ironically, we won't have God because we can only have God, remember, like a butterfly, when we are so free of the pairs of opposites, know what the root of the problem is, and then sitting very, very still, in God, for God, as God, to God, alone, that now God is able to fill our whole sense of being and indeed dissolve any remaining belief we're hanging on to. So now realize that God has no good in it whatsoever. God is, period, and has only itself in it and as it. God has only itself as the very mind and experience of us, of being at this degree of awareness. God has only itself. God is only itself. And there's the reason we seek just God for itself and for no other reason. God has nothing else for us. God has only itself as us. And so our whole goal is to know the truth we now know and then seek for ever greater awareness and living experience of God for God, as God, to God. And then it is, certainly, that that greater awareness of God is experienced coming alive in us as new wisdom. It's interpreted wisdom, a higher, more divine wisdom we are suddenly aware of, certainly. Or we have more intelligence, more understanding. Or we witness more of divine and truthful form that the world has never seen before. Get out of the idea that what the world has is all the world has. Get out of the idea that we could take account of all the leaves and all the fruit and all the flowers and all the fragrance and all the dollars and all the beings and then determine what the world has and all it has. Here we are, this is all it has and we have to share it between seven billion. Lose that idea. Not more than about 70 years ago there were only four billion of us. Now there are seven billion of us. Do you think that's only true of what we call a human being, but not true of dollars? Or can you understand that it is true of leaves and flowers and fruit, but not true of dollars? Not true of customers, clients? If you believe such a thing, you're wrong. Because there's only one thing happening, and that's God. It doesn't matter what we name it or what form it seems to be. It is God. Every new bud and leaf and flower and fruit, every new fragrance has never been experienced by the world before. 
Every new being has never been experienced by the world before. And there's no difference between the bud and the leaf and the flower and the fruit and the being than there is the dollar. Then there is the new miracle. Then there is the new healing. The new opportunity. The new wisdom that suddenly filling the world the new idea that makes all that which is unjust take a U-turn and become just. It makes all that which is diseased or discordant or in poverty or in depression or in prison release its doors and reveal its truthful amount and freedom and being, opportunity, purpose. Every time Every time we feel the peace happening, new form is in the world for all to see. Every time. And if you will stop categorizing and stop believing it of some form but not of others, in other words, <laughs> again, get out of the pairs of opposites. Get out of belief. Stop believing. You don't need belief at all. All you need is is. Be the being of is. And realize that is is infinite and omnipresent. And that infinity never stops being evident. Remember, when God utters his voice, the earth melts. And when the earth melts, when belief melts, the pairs of opposites melt, there in its place is truth. And what is truth? Infinite. Never limited. You can't account for truth. You can't go around and count it up and say, well, this is what, at this level of experience called the earth, we have as our formation, as our amount, as our wisdom. It's impossible. You can only do that if you're living in belief, which is living in the pairs of opposites. And even if you do that, you're going to find it difficult to keep up because... There is forever new form even to the material sense of experience. But look at inflation. Just take inflation alone. There it is. There's ever new amount and new value pouring through at a rate we can all hardly keep up with if we're living a material sense of experience. But now come into truth and realize that truth is infinite and omnipresent and ever revealing itself at the speed of light, actually at the speed of God. And so, never count and believe what you're counting. Never believe you're limited in any way or of anything. You're not. You only are if you are living the pairs of opposites. And then, unfortunately, right in front of you always and right around you everywhere is infinity of form, but your experience is finite only because you are freezing it by belief. You're freezing what is in appearance as being just what is in appearance and the nature, the quality, the type of whatever it is that's in experience, good or bad, by belief. Get out of belief, live is, and realize that is is omnipresent and infinite and revealing itself forevermore and wherever you are at the speed of God, as you are feeling God and living God and are completely and utterly satisfied with knowing God and experiencing God alone. We don't need God for anything. God is, and if we will start living is, the first thing we will experience is this omnipresent peace of being. We live a constant state of peace because we're living a constant state of is, free of the pairs of opposites, trusting that God is indeed all, trusting Jesus, when he tells us not to judge by appearance because you're judging a lie. 
if you judge by appearance. But to judge is judge righteous judgment. Judge the truth of God as all and the finished kingdom of all. I hope, I hope you're hearing of the importance of knowing the finished kingdom so that you're never trying to get God to do something, to finish something which seems to be unfinished, incomplete, missing a part of itself or many parts of itself or missing quality or condition, good, fulfilled, beautiful, bountiful condition of whatever it may be, life or dollars or love or customers or clients or activity or safety or home. Do not judge by appearance, but judge by is. And the only thing you really have to judge is you. What are you doing? How are you living? What is your truth? How are you free of the pairs of opposites? How much do you know that belief is the pairs of opposites? And belief is the personal sense that's believing the pairs of opposites. How much do you know that? How much are you able to live it? How much are you rooting out that belief from your every hour? Or maybe better, from your every minute? How much? How much are you then resting and letting God take over, letting God reveal itself? How much are you knowing that every second you do, every second you feel peace, your whole universe is full of the actual visibility of truth as you, as mind, as form? How much do you know that? How much do you trust it? How much are you sitting and beholding truth rather than making an effort for truth? And so live in a constant state of is. All is. All is the finished kingdom of is, of God. Therefore, as I know this and as I spend more and more of my time resting, simply resting, being a beholder of God as experience, even God as thought, as you rest in the truth, when you know the truth so that the truth is indeed now making you free and you're able to rest, then even your thought will spring forth as God thought, God idea, God awareness, truth awareness. You'll have the most extraordinary revelation about all kinds of things. You'll be filled with God. And because God is always formed, whether that form in our sense is a thought, an idea, a wisdom, a knowledge, or the truthful form of body or dollars or opportunity or whatever it may be, it doesn't make any difference. It's all the same one form becoming ever more vibrant and alive and real as you. And so as God fills you, God experience, God form is your experience. And as you do this, indeed you live a constant state of peace. Nothing can disturb you. You live a constant state of happiness because you know the truth is right here, fully formed, even though appearance may not testify to it this minute or this hour or this day or this week. So what? So what? The moment you know the truth is, you're safe. And nothing can affect you, nothing can cut you down, nothing can destroy you, nothing can even stop you. You see, if our attention still rests even somewhat, in the pairs of opposites, then it isn't understood yet that the pairs of opposites and the way they appear to be don't matter to experience. Because experience is God. 
The fulfilment of being is God being. And so it doesn't matter what is seeming to take place or what seems not to have yet taken place in amongst the pairs of opposites. It doesn't matter. And it's that releasing of our concern about or our desire for the fulfillment to be evident to us as what we would describe as form that actually ever more gets that experience of truth to be evident to us. But if we're still concerned or we still say, well, it does stop me. There is something of my earthly experience that is stopping me still because truthful form isn't yet evident to me. Where are we? And it's a difficult thing sometimes. We indeed seem to, in experience, have to sometimes wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the evidence of truthful form. But we've got to, when we're having those experiences, and we all do, Jesus did, St. Francis did, read the little flowers. St. Francis had many, many times when it seemed as if he was living in great poverty, great inability to feed the world and do good for his world. But you see, we, and we all do. Why? Because we're still hanging on to the desire to be able to be truthful in our earthly experience. But what that means is we're still hanging on to belief that our earthly experience is a part of our truthful experience. Well, our earthly experience in this case is actually the pairs of opposites experience. And the pairs of opposites experience has no place in our truth. So it's a subtle thing. But what I want to tell you is that if it seems as if you're still waiting for truthful form to be evident in any category of experience and you can't understand why or maybe you can't understand how to live or you can't hear yet that truthful being or spiritual being has no need of matter, no need of the fulfillment of material form because it's already in fulfillment. Its whole fulfillment is spirit and spirit is already here and forever here and omnipresent right here infinite right here. So I am fulfilled despite what form seems to be doing or not to be doing. And so if we can just hear that and have the strength to live that and keep away from the pairs of opposites and just sit patiently, I think patience is one of the needed things in truth, greatly, greatly needed in truth. The human being can't be patient. Everything's urgent for the human being. But in truth, we have this great patience. We're unhurried. We don't care. I'll sit. I have all the patience in the universe. I'll just sit and wait. In truth, feeling God happen. And I don't really care. I'm not bothered by the fact that it may not be evident to me through my corporeal sense. I don't care. I know it's there, even though my corporeal sense isn't detecting it yet. So I know all is good. I know he or she is perfectly safe. They're not going to die. They're going to be fine. They are fine right now because all they are is God being. And I know that and I can sit in peace and experience their God being right here and now by feeling their being, feeling the peace happening. So it doesn't matter if my corporeal senses do not yet detect the whole and truthful being that they are. It doesn't matter. I'm feeling them here, and that's the only thing that matters. I'm experiencing them here, and that's the only thing that matters. The corporeal sense does not matter. And yet, we know that the corporeal sense is infallible as the oneness of experience, as we are fulfilled by and as spirit alone. So it's a subtle thing, and we have to hear that spiritual being is completely fulfilled and never needs matter. We have to hear that 
and then live and experience that fulfillment and be patient with the corporeal sense. The poor old thing is very slow. Be patient with it. It gets faster. It rises from its sluggish approach to truth, to life. It rises. It picks up a a life, a vibrancy, a vitality and becomes, in many cases, very fast. But treat it with love and don't be concerned about it. You live in and as your truth and be completely satisfied with that and then exercise great patience with the corporeal sense. And it's then that the corporeal sense picks up its legs and becomes ever more evident and ever more quickly evident. I hate to tell you this again because I have told it to you before, but I don't care what the appearance of you looks like or what you claim it to be when you reach out for healing. I'm not interested in you. I never think about you. As soon as I put that phone down or send that email, that's you gone from my experience. And I'm not looking back. You're not in my Awareness. Only God is in my awareness. And that's why you'll never find me checking up on you. How are you doing? You'll never receive a phone call or an email from me saying, how are you doing? How is it feeling today? If you did, then I'd be utterly useless to you. Because I have a you in my belief rather than only God happening in my being. So you see... Even if you email or call and say, I am on my last few hours of life according to Materia Medica, this disease has got the better of me and I'm on my way out in a few hours. And that's all I hear from you. It doesn't make any difference to me. Because what you really are and what's emailing me, what's presenting itself to me is only God. And I'd never have to check up on God. I don't have to look back and discover how God's doing. Because I know God is life and life eternal, fully embodied. So you will almost definitely never come back into my awareness unless you email again and then here you are again, dressed up in your holly bush suit or your illness suit, or your disease suit, or your lack suit, or your depression suit, or your insecurity suit, your homelessness suit, whatever it may be that you're wearing today. And then again, you'll have the same reaction. Leave it to me. Rest, relax. Be gently attentive to the peace you begin feeling happening within as truth is being known for you. That's it. Again, that's the end of you in my awareness. And I share this with you, not to try to upset you, but to let you know how you are to be for or in the face of your experience. Don't look back at your body. Don't look back at your dollars. Don't waste your energy doing such a thing because you're putting your energy, you're putting your awareness back into the pairs of opposites. But if you stay in God, if you can now find the spiritual strength to stay in God and not look back, then you will find yourself firstly in a constant state of peace. I quite like that sentence. Shall we have a book? A constant state of peace. Indeed, you find yourself in a constant state of peace. You find yourself in God and nothing but, or very little but, let's say. You find the light of truth filling all your senses and bursting out as your whole universe. 
in that way you know that any material belief remaining is being quickly dissolved. Search me, God. I'm doing my best, but I'm a beginner at this. So search me and dissolve any remaining belief. I am ready for it to be gone. And then you will discover that your fulfillment of the light and the presence of truth comes to you in ways that are miraculous. You have a wisdom pushing through. You have an idea pushing through. You witness the activity of God as your condition, as your experience. You witness new form coming into your experience. You receive a telephone call. Someone walks into your life. Just that very person that brings with him or her an opportunity or something you needed or some piece of comfort or hope or wisdom you needed. There are an infinite number of ways in which truth presents itself to you. But one way or the other and infallibly as you stay in God and feel yourself filled with the light of truth you suddenly discover any or much of an infinity of new form pushing through you with nothing able to stop it. And so you may find your... It's really funny to me speaking of these little individual experiences because any of an infinite number of things can happen. But you may find yourself lifted up and writing something or doing something or serving in some way or you have a whole new idea for that which you're doing a whole new idea of serving people giving them offering them what you're able to serve with today and it's truth it's a beautiful simple succinct gorgeous piece of whatever it is form idea activity And you sit on its wings and fly off with it. And in this way, you discover it is the wholeness of your experience. It proves itself to be whole in every way as you send it out. You discover your body is free of pain and healed, vital. Here, finally, is the truthful body. And you know, although it looks the same to everybody else, and although everybody else may call it a miraculous healing, it doesn't quite look or feel the same to you. It never is. Now you're beginning to feel the infinity of body, the true spiritual body. And often that body will not have an edge. It won't feel like a weight. You're not aware of it as you used to be aware of it. It's a wholly different experience. Suddenly, all the necessary dollars flow into your experience, just like rain flows into your experience, just like the marbles roll downhill. Suddenly a friend, suddenly a love, suddenly a teaching, a book, an audio, something, something flows into your experience. Suddenly safety is available to you or present right here for you. Suddenly comfort. Suddenly a great surge of hope fills you. New strength fills you. Any which way, truth is very evident and frees you from this imprisonment you were living So please find the strength to stay in truth and free of the pairs of opposites. Why don't you read Psalm 46 a number of times and let it live you. Realise what it's saying. Realise the practical truth of what it is saying. And let it start living you. He utters his voice, the earth, melts ah even
Jesse's feeling that. Well, let's stop here. Thank you so very much.